Okay, today I'm going to talk about the really reality of climate change and what can we do. Now a lot of you may think, how did it all start for me? Well, I'm a physics graduate, and I know a lot of people, when they hear the word physics, the first thing that comes to mind is, yes, work, momentum, force, which is correct. But when you hear, or when a physics graduate hear the word physics, the first thing that comes to mind is energy. Now, I wanted to use a platform so I can use whatever I have to bring to limelight to actually represent the scientific community to give a great message. I am not an environmental scientist, so I had to do my research. What is one of the biggest issues that our world is facing right now, which is global warming and climate change? And the purpose or the sole reason of this is the excess of carbon emission in the atmosphere. Now, I further think, what is one thing that people have access to nowadays? That's electricity. And electricity is connected to energy. So I had to find a relation in my field to that. Now, if a lot of the countries, such as the Philippines, and also other countries, still use coal power plants, when you burn fossil fuels, you actually release carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. There, I already found my connection. If there is a problem, there must be a solution. That's why I furthered my research. The solution would be renewable energy, such as solar and wind turbines, and so on. That is how it all started when I advocated about the conservation of energy and the use of renewable energy. I won Miss Earth 2017 last November of 2017, and ever since then, I traveled the world from Asia to Europe to South America and to Africa. And I had the chance to see what was the real problem, what were the problems that are, we are going through in different parts of the planet. If I'm going to ask you what is the most serious issue facing our world today, well, according to the World Economic Forum Global Shapers Annual Survey of 2016, 45% unique responses identified that climate change and destruction of natural resources are one of them. And you can truly attest to that when it comes to the Philippines. It's very much known. Now let me give you just a brief background of a little science. I know um, people or the students in front of me are science students. In our solar system, we have the sun and we have the earth. In the earth, we have the atmosphere. And in the atmosphere, we have what we call as greenhouse gases. Now for us to sustain life in the planet, we need heat, a certain amount of heat. That heat comes from the sun. The sun gives us sunlight, but not everything is absorbed by the planet. Some are reflected back in space, but the greenhouse gases are the ones responsible for trapping the heat in the planet. And that is what you, what you call as the greenhouse effect. Now what happens if you increase the levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere? You are going to increase the amount of temperature in the planet. Then I was asked one time, okay Karen, you know how to explain climate change and you know the concept of climate change, but how can you explain climate change to a five-year-old kid? I want you all to listen to this, because I remember what my professor told me when I was in college. If you want to be a lecturer or a speaker, you need to make your topic understandable by all people. So you always have to use layman's term. So I started thinking of what this is the perfect analogy to explain to a five-year-old kid what climate change is all about. Now, I found the perfect analogy. Climate change is quite similar to the science of the human body. You need heat for you to sustain your life. But because of the external forces or the things that you do, such as eating all those ice cream and playing in the rain, and you don't sleep early, you can have a fever. Just simply by adding one degree Celsius to your body, you already have a fever. And it's quite the same with the planet. It's like the planet is having a fever because there's excess of the temperature. Now, these are the sources of greenhouse gases, such as carbon dioxide, which is the main greenhouse gases, which is um, taken by the burning of fossil fuels, followed by methane, which is quite a powerful gas that comes from wetlands and agricultures and landfills, where your garbages go, and livestock. Nitrous oxide from your automobile exhaust, and of course, your different kinds of carbon, such as your HFCs and others. HFCs is very common in refrigerators and air conditioners. So if you're not using them properly, you're actually emitting so much carbon. Now, if you look at the screen, those are the biggest sources of greenhouse gases because of human activities, such as transport. 
air, land, water. We have forest burning, we have agricultures, we have industries, and coal mining. Now, scientists believe there is a natural greenhouse gas effect in the planet, but because of all the human activities being done, there is an increase of greenhouse gases that goes to the atmosphere. That's why there is what we call as global warming and the increase of temperature in the planet. You have top 10 emitters of greenhouse gases, such as China, United States, followed by India, Russia, and Japan. The Philippines is not a part of it because we're still a developing country. And of course, this is not a list that you want to be a part of. Now I'm going to give you three facts, three indisputable facts to show that climate change really is happening, and it's science-based. First one is the Earth is warming. The average temperature, or the global average temperature of the Earth's surface has increased by about 0.85 degrees Celsius before pre-industrial times, or during pre-industrial times. That is when before machineries were created to make the lives of people better. But when these were created, sometimes it's used in excess. That's why all these things are happening. Now, you can see here that in the x-axis, you would see the year from 1880 to 2016. And in the y-axis, you would see the temperature anomaly and the carbon dioxide concentration. Once you increase the amount of carbon dioxide, you're actually increasing the temperature. And that's what's happening in the planet. The second one, the sea level is rising. In the Earth, um, more water is found here than land. And since 1900, sea levels have risen by an average of 19 centimeters globally. You have to understand in this case that it's not simply a body in your experiment in laboratories. We're talking about a global scale. And for you to add one centimeter globally, that is already a huge deal and it's going to be affected, or islands are going to be affected, such as us, because we have long coastlines. The third one is the ice is melting. This is a photo from NASA to show that in 1984, this was the amount of ice that was left. And in 2012, this is the one, only ones that was seen. So it really shows that different sciences are actually um, coinciding into one conclusion, that climate change really is happening. And Leonardo DiCaprio says that the science is clear, but the future is not. He is now a UN, a ma UN messenger of peace, and he actually created a documentary named Beyond the Flood. It's so easy for you to just search it on YouTube, and it's very comprehensive and informative at the same time. He actually interviewed different professions from astronauts to environmental scientists, and they really show that all the conclusions are just converging to one. Now, the Paris Agreement. A lot of people are not aware of the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement was held last December 2015 in Paris, and it took effect last November 4, 2016. But what is a Paris Agreement? This is when all the world leaders came together to talk about climate change and global warming and what must we do to, in order for us to cut the carbon emission that we do. Now, they actually set a limit to a global average temperature, which is 2 degrees Celsius. We're not supposed to exceed that. And we're already 0.85 degrees Celsius, and we're experiencing all these things in the planet. But they further the limit to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And the Philippines is a part of this Paris Agreement. That's why we have to learn how to mitigate our waste to lessen the carbon emission. Now, you might ask me, the Philippines is not a major contributor of greenhouse gases, but why are we so vulnerable to climate change? Well. It's because of our geographical location. It's one thing that we cannot do about. According to World Risk Report of 2016, Philippines is ranked third among countries most risk of disaster. But in the recent report of 2019, the Philippines actually went below from third to ninth. That is because vulnerability is actually composed of susceptibility, adaptation, and coping. So people must know how to do it. And there is a right strategy for us to do it as well with the help of the government. Now, let's go to the waters. The water is the biggest victim of climate change. You can see in this photo, the before and after. This is actually a photo or a part in the Pacific Ocean where all these corals are so colorful and alive. After quite some time, they bleached and they died. Corals are very important because they are the habitat and spawning and feeding of a lot of marine species, which is connected to us because 
of the livelihoods of our fisher folks, and we are the fish tubers of them. But that's not all the problem that we have. We also have plastic pollution. It's one of the biggest problems that we're facing. And I'm sad to say that the Philippines is one of the biggest plastic polluters in the whole world. You can see here the sea turtles are eating the plastics, the birds, and of course we have the whale sharks or the butanding that we call it in the Philippines. These creatures cannot distinguish plastic from not plastic or plastic from their food. So they tend to eat everything. What happens is that their bodies cannot digest all these things, that's why they die. But the sad part is, even when their bodies decompose, the plastic will just simply go back to the ocean. You see the effect? And in time, plastics are not biodegradable, but they degrade into small pieces called as microplastics. And when that happens, it's very much easily eaten by these creatures. And sometimes fishes actually eat microplastic. And you don't know, sometimes those microplastics are already on your table and you're already eating them. It actually backfires at us, whatever we're doing. Now, you've seen some of the causes, and I'm gonna give you some solutions that's quite visible for what I can do and what you can do. How can we help? The first one is to conserve your energy. If you're not using your light, if you're not using your air conditioner, just simply turn it off. If you can use the sunlight, why turn on the light? As simple as that, reduce your food waste. If you cannot finish everything, don't buy it. There's so much carbon emission that was actually used up before that food was put on your table. And you're increasing all this methane that goes to the landfills if you not eat them. There's so many people in the planet who cannot even afford what you have. The third one is to diversify your diet. Who among here eats burger? I eat burger, but I'm not telling you not to eat burger. I'm just saying to learn to diversify your diet. A lot of people love to eat meat, and steak, and pork. That's okay. But what I'm saying is for you not to stop. What I'm saying is for you to learn to lessen it and eat more vegetables. You know why? Because the global livestock industry produces more greenhouse gases compared to all cars, trains, planes, and ships combined. So I'm just saying for you to just lessen it and eat more vegetables and fruit. You're actually helping the environment by doing that. The third one is to conserve your water. Water is life. You cannot wait for water to run out before you see how important it is. It's also important for us to protect our forests because forests are the one that takes in carbon dioxide and releases oxygen for us. It also holds the soil for it not to erode and absorbs all this flood when it happens. And to walk, fly, and use trains when you're just going to a near place. I'm not saying not to use cars. I also have a car, but I'm just saying that we have to lessen what we actually consume every single day. And of course, to refuse those plastics. Every time I give talks, people always um, open their eyes to this, how important it is. How many of you have tumblers? I believe a lot of you have tumblers. And a lot of people just actually collect tumblers and put them in the shelves and don't use them. Well, actually, it's important for you to use your tumblers, start washing them, always bring them with you, for you to avoid a single use of plastic bottles. You know, I give talks, sometimes people give me a plastic bottle and I would just simply refuse because I always bring my tumbler with me no matter where I go. The second one, I heard someone answer the metal straw earlier. The metal straw or the bamboo straw. If you can't, um, if you're trying to just drink something, you can actually drink it even without a single use of plastic straw, even if you don't have any metal straw. If you're one of those people who actually think that, hey, it's just one straw. How many billions of people have the same mindset as you? And sometimes you just don't take it or use a plastic straw once a week. Sometimes you take it twice a week. So you multiply that. Can you imagine how much plastic is being consumed just because you thought, hey, it's just one plastic? But you have the same mindset as other people. That's why we're encouraging others to change their ways as simple as that. And using of echo bags. Everybody goes to the grocery stores. Everybody goes and buys stuff. And a lot here in the Philippines still use what we call as the sando plastic bags. So when you use your echo bags, you're just actually reusing them. And you're not consuming all this single-use plastic. And, of course, there are other things such as recycling the plastic. Because sometimes when you buy things, there's still plastic that is included. And sometimes you can't say no to it. That's why um, recycling plastic 
there is what we call a, a plastic solution, where they actually make eco bricks. Um, these people were actually, I believe they were surfers, and they wanted to remove the plastics in the ocean. That's why they started this movement and found that if there's a consumed plastic bottle, you can simply just stuff all the other plastic inside, and you can use them as an alternative for hollow blocks. Not for buildings, but for low-cost housing and other things like walls of gardening. In, order to, in that way, you're actually recycling the plastic. And it also shows that you have to lessen the plastic consumption that you do every single day. And of course, the three R's. As simple as reuse, reduce, and recycle. And these are the things that I'm actually showing you. And of course, I want you to share it to other people. As simple as educating other people. I was asked this question in front of millions of people. Who or what do you think is the biggest enemy of Mother Earth and why? And without hesitation, I said that the real problem of this world is not climate change. The real problem is us because of our ignorance and apathy. What we have to do is to start changing our ways, to start recalibrating our minds and redirecting our steps, because only together as a global community, our micro efforts can have a macro effect to help save the planet. Thank you very much.